today we're going to talk micrometers and relate it to the decimal equivalence chart, just like we did with the dial calipers. We'll refer to this chart behind me. We'll actually confer and make some observations about measurement and some comparisons and all kinds of cool stuff. For this one, I'm going to talk about the use of micrometers and how to read them and actually the application of how to read them. I've seen a lot of videos here on YouTube that'll talk about how to read them, but they want to actually show you using them. There's a general feel to using a micrometer to know when you're getting a more accurate measurement. Typically, you can measure it too tightly or too loosely and get an inaccurate measurement. And when you're getting into this amount of precision, you have to be careful with what you're doing. So get ready to get into some serious measurement theory on this one. I will be going into pin gauges and telling you what those are and actually how to measure them with micrometers so we can get a more accurate measurement. We're going to compare whether our measurements are exactly what the pins should be. And we're going to talk about how you can get the measurement wrong. Today I'll be using two minatorial micrometers, both digital, but they have a veneer on the turnstile on the side. So you can actually read analog or digital depending on how you wish to use these. In theory, I feel like this tells you how to read any version you can think of. For the Imperial system, they're typically set up for a 0 to 1 inch or a 1 to 2 inch and so on and so forth. Typically, any measurement you make will be under 1 inch, so therefore it's under the 1 inch mark. When you have a 1 to 2 inch micrometer, you already know that 1 inch has passed, so any measurement you have is increments between 1 and 2 inches. So therefore, if you measure 0.5 on a 1 to 2 inch mic, you know it's 1.5 inches. Micrometers really have a tactile feel to them. You want to be really careful when measuring with them because of the degree of accuracy or precision that they have or both they can give you inaccurate measurements because of how you handle them you have to really know what you're feeling and really know what you're doing to use one that said it shouldn't discourage you from using them because they're a great tool and in my other video about using dial calipers we've got into some discussions in the commentary about the accuracy or when you should choose to use calipers versus a micrometer. That choice is up to you. It depends on the material, uh, the application, really the end result or the tolerances you're talking about. You could use a micrometer on wood if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. It's honestly up to you. It's kind of subjective, but you just know that when you're using a micrometer that the accuracy is more reliable. Even with the error that can present itself while using them, you can still achieve a higher degree of accuracy than with calipers. But when you're measuring with each of these instruments, both calipers and micrometers, you can technically overforce it and produce inaccurate measurements. So you can flex a caliper maybe within one to two thousandths by pushing it too hard when you're measuring around an object, the jaws will actually flex because every material flexes. Every material has an elasticity and you really need to think about that when you're doing this because even though the calipers may be a hardened material, they still have a degree of flex to them when you're using them. If you force it too much, you can actually produce inaccurate measurements. The same goes for micrometers. So we'll talk about that with the application of it. But for now, let's get into actually using the measure and we'll talk about how to read the scale along the side and compare it with the digital readout on the micrometer itself. So here you can see both my zero to one inch micrometer and the one to two inch micrometer and my set of dial calipers for comparison later. And you can see with the zero to one, you can go all the way down, unlock it. You can go all the way down to zero. And it closes up all the way. And this is what's called the clutch. This is a turn with a neural on the side. These numbers here represent increments of 0 0.025. So typically you read, you add those increments up together. So here, you can see we just crossed the uh, we just crossed the point one barrier. There's four increments, so to equal, you can see the digital readout here says point one. This is also point one. So they read it's four times point zero two five, which equals point one. So visually, you have to think about and count these lines when you're reading an analog version versus digital. Digital takes all the mental math out of it, but typically you have to add all these up and this will equal 0.1. So when you're adding, so you move it over here. So see, I'm in between this distance now. I am at 0.110 essentially. 
So I'm at the 10,000th mark. And this digital readout really helps for you to understand what it is you're seeing over here, I feel. So you got your nominal measurements. Let's say you want to do quarter inch. So exactly a quarter inch. You can see here, you've gone two full ticks on the major lines here to 0.2. So that's eight times 0 0.025. And you've gone two more ticks past the two to equal 50 thousandths more. So you're at 0 0.250. So it's kind of hard to understand sometimes where on this line you, you are. So you can typically see when it's just past the line on the right side of this line is when you're fully past the line. And you can count the full 0 0.025, full 25 thousandths. You can easily, when in a hurry, make the mistake of reading these and thinking, oh, I was at two, you know, I was another 25 thousandths past, and you could add that to the 250 instead. Let's do a game here. So I'm gonna cover that up. We're gonna say, let's, let's go to three eighths, another nominal measurement here. So where would three eighths be? It'd be three ticks of 25 thousandths past the three. So that's what three eighths would look like. So this is, you know, your three, the main hundred thousandths increments here, you're past the three, so you count that. Your three increments of 25 thousandths past there. So then you count that. So this is all nice round nominal measurements. But when you get into the nitty gritty, you start counting these numbers over here. This counts the thousandths on the bottom and see adding that to it can be interesting as well. So if you're not on the line, you just simply go, so you have three, so you have 0.3 and you're at least three lines past this. So you know it's at least three eighths, so it's 0.375, but you're also an additional 15 thousandths past that third mark of 25 thousandths, therefore you add 15 thousandths to the 75 thousandths you already have. So you have to do the mental math and add it together. So that would be 90. So it's 0 0.390. So let's see if I'm right on this. 15 thousandths past 0 0.075 would equal 0 0.890. There you go. It's very close. So you have to do this mental math in your head for micrometers to understand what you're looking at. You have to look at which major number you've passed in hundred thousandths here. You have to count the number of ticks and add up in your head how many ticks times 0 0.025 you have there. And then after that, you still have to add this number to the end. And you can typically write it down on a piece of paper. It really helps. Uh, well, as you do this more and more, you can actually understand and do it in your head and you get in practice with it. So there's the first error you can make with the micrometer is by adding the numbers up poorly in your head. Like I said, the digitals are really nice. They are also more expensive. So if you have an analog version, you have to really think about this and be aware and you have to be present when you're measuring so that you get the accurate measurement. Adding all this up in your head is non-trivial, especially when you're looking for this degree of accuracy. So it's very important for you to think about that. And so I've had a lot of people commenting on my short that'll give me a measurement that they think it was for the plywood that I was measuring. You can go check it out and see what you think. But I've had to go back and re-verify my measurements to make sure that I was correct. And it turns out I was, but people will add it up differently in their head with how they're looking at it and it causes uh, wrong numbers. It causes inaccuracy. So you really have to be careful with this. So. So it's really interesting how to read these, but I think the real proof is in the pudding, as you might say. So we'll have to look at some of these gauge pins, which I have, and I've got some nominal measurements and some crazy measurements here. I got 0.558. I have a nominal 5 eighths, which would be 625. And these are a minus pin gauge set. Therefore, that means they're undersized so that when put into a hole, that is 5 eighths, for instance, it'll actually slip in there and indicate that it's 5 eighths. But this goes into the discussion of fits. So you have slip fit, line to line fit, and press fit, and you have varying degrees of that depending upon what type of assembly you're looking for. But this is designed to be just ever so subtly a slip fit so that you can fit inside the hole. 
If the hole and the pin gauge were both 0.625, it would be what's called a line-to-line -line fit. Therefore, it would be almost a press fit. You could not slip it in there easily and then pull it back out. It would be very difficult and actually might be very well a nice static fit or friction fit. And so these have to be undersized so that it can indicate the correct size. So there goes into the science of measurement. Precision ground instruments are all about comparison, but even this is not exactly 5 eighths because it's designed to fit within a 5 eighths hole. Therefore, it has to be ground undersized to get to that point. So you can use it as a reference point. So we'll measure this and we'll see what it actually is. And we'll use the micrometer to see what it is. And we'll talk about how to measure a round object and make sure that you get the right fit on it. And we'll talk about the use of the clutch and how it feels when you're doing this. And really the only way to master this is to do it over and over again. If you're confident in adding up all the numbers here, you can actually do a pretty good job. And if you want a digital readout so you can understand it all, that's fine. But I say you should really be able to use this veneer over here to understand what you're looking at and to add it up in your head. It's really not that hard once you get down to it. Same with dial calipers versus digital calipers. If you're using this in a professional setting, using it a few times, you'll get it. It should be fine. And if worst case scenario, measurement is about comparison. So you can take a set of calipers that you know how to read and compare it to it and see if you're getting the right measurement. Double check yourself. You know, the old adage of measure twice, cut once is really true. And quite honestly, as a machinist, I've typically measured three to four times. You never know. And so you always want to double check yourself because you could easily get into inaccuracy by either not paying attention. Sometimes you can measure the wrong side of something. Sometimes you have to average out the measurements. Sometimes you just need a basis of comparison and to get it the right size and fit. And it's really all about feel. If you're a machinist and you've been making things for a long time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't been, then I highly suggest you get a good feel for sizes and start measuring things and understand what that means. And you have to, it's a tactile feeling you learn with your hands to be able to understand what fits really mean. And so um, it'd be really nice to have a kit to compare sizes so you know what a slip fit feels like, what a press fit feels like, what a line to line fit would feel like or measure and by comparison. So as you make more things, and if, you're, if you are a machinist, as you make more things, you will develop this skill and once you have it, you know it. And if you don't know it, you're thinking I'm crazy. So moving on. So I talked about before how this is precision ground to fit within a hole that is exactly 625 thousandths or 5 eighths of an inch. So this is undersized from 5 eighths. And I'm wagering it'll be several tenths below size. We'll start with my dial calipers and we'll measure what this is supposed to be. So it is showing exactly 625 thousandths, which is nice. It's very close. This is what I'm talking about with calipers, and this is what I'll show later with micrometers. You can force it. See how you can flex it almost a thousandth just by pressing it further in. If you got, if you over flex this, the material within these tongs here actually has enough flex that it can make it look like it's undersized by about a thousandth. So you got to really work on your pressure here. You got to feel it with your thumb and you kind of work this back and forth, spin it even if you can, and get an equilibrium so you know what your measurement is. You can get very accurate measurements with this, but, but you really have to be careful. And that's always a feel, that's a repetition, that's a learning exercise for people who use this kind of precision. So if we use the digital calipers, you have to typically twirl these out to whatever you know it is, give yourself some clearance, oversize, so we know it's 625 thousandths. I'm getting about seven over. I'm going to measure the OD on this. So you kind of have to get it in between the anvils here to get it, to get the tangent on the anvil of the micrometer. These little hardened tips are anvils and they're carbide typically, so it gets an accurate measurement. So this one tells a different story. This is about five to, no, it's a little bit under. It should be undersized for 625 thousandths. And see how I get different measurements depending on where I'm going. I'm using this clutch to do the final torque down on it so that this doesn't tighten down as much as it could. So I can move this around. It's not very tight 
I can feet squeeze it through and it's okay. And that gives me a more accurate measurement. That shows to be one tenth undersized. So it's precision ground one tenth under 625 thousandths. So I can pass this through and get a easy, and get a very accurate measurement. But you can typically over flex this just like calipers and you can get them down to even more. So, you know, that's only in the measure of tenths that you can flex it on a set of micrometers, but you can flex it for a full thousandth on a set of calipers. So therefore, that shows you the degree of accuracy that this has versus the micrometer. You're proceeding into accuracy within tenths on this versus thousandths on the micrometer. So this, so this will show you quite a bit, but that feel that I have, that working back and forth to check the size, this is, uh, this is something you have to learn how to do. But to check the diameter of round objects in a lathe, typically it'd be horizontal and you could do it like, like so, but you kind of have to work it back and forth get a really good feel for it, make sure it's not too tight, and then you should have an accurate measurement. So I would say this is generally within one-tenth under. I'm getting the fluctuations all the way down to the fifth decimal place, which these are supremely accurate on the digital side of things. So if you want that level of accuracy, digital is the way to go. We looked at the digital side of things. We didn't necessarily add up over here. So I've got you're past the 0.6, so those are your 100 thousandths, you're already starting with 0.6. You're only one tick in on the 25 thousandths, on the 25 thousandths marks, so therefore it's 0.65. So 5 eighths is really relatively easy to do. I'm doing nominal dimensions here so that you can understand what real easy roundable fractions will look like, and then we'll do some weird measurements so you can actually do those. When adding up the numbers on the veneer scale, some are more difficult than others. So let's go to a 0.903. Not a recognizable fraction at all, just a nice, odd decimal point. I suppose there's a fraction out there that actually work, but not a nominal fraction at all. So this bad boy, you already know the measurement here, 0.903, but let's look at the veneer side. You're just past 0 0.9 and you're just reading 903. So that's easily added up. There are zero 25 thousandths ticks in the middle here. So that was an easy add up to, even though it's not nominal. Now we'll see 558. Okay, so we're already past the five, so we're at 0. 0.5, and then two ticks of 25 thousandths, so it'd be 550, and then we're at 8 thousandths, or around about, about a tenth under, just like we have been on these undersized pin gauges. So really, it's not too bad. All it really takes is practice, just like a lot of things. Working with these micrometers is not that difficult. You just have to learn how to read the numbers. I, I really love analog, but I think that preferences. I think my analog preference is showing itself throughout these videos. I like digital. That's really nice. The accuracy you can get on that is amazing. And I'm very happy with that because that's just insane. Is it practical for me and things that I've ever done in my life? Not really. I've only ever done machining into the tents or for press fits for scientific experiments or scientific equipment. These are far beyond whatever I could do. But if you're, say, in a gauge tool and die, gauge making facility, and you needed this degree of accuracy, these would be pretty good. But I bet they have some other way of measuring these that's a little bit more accurate. One really interesting thing about pin gauges is that they broach into the science of measurement. Measurement is actually only a comparison whenever it gets down to it. So somebody ages ago decided what an inch was. They set the standard. They carved a rock that was what they said was an inch long. And then from then on, that rock was the gauge for measuring an inch. So they have standards of measurements where they reference what an inch is. They've 
they keep these things in storage and all of these things that we make and measure metric and me, metric as well is all a basis of comparison to the original marker for what should be a measurement so these these pin gauges are no different they're about a these pin gauges are about a measurement that is a comparison to something that is 558.558 inches in diameter. I wanted to show this zero, the one, the twos, just to give you an idea of what it is, what it looks like. So you always have to know where you're starting with your micrometer sets. So I've got that at an inch. I can't go any further closed. This distance here is exactly one inch and every increment later is that same scale of one inch on the micrometer to measure. So when you are adding all these numbers together, you add your one inch first, say for instance here, you're 200 thousandths past, just like the digital readout says, and your thousandths. So you add all those numbers together. All it does is really give you one other digit to add on the other side of the decimal place to get your accurate measurements. It's really not that bad. These go in increments all the way up to who knows what. I, there are calipers that measure in several feet and they're gargantuan. So these are more typical with the one inch, two inch, three inch increments. You can get sets of these where they have them all the way up to a certain size. You can buy them individually, all that kind of stuff. But it just depends on your application, but most people don't really have to go that large. And those are typically bought for specific applications or specific parts that they need that large diameter for. So if you've gotten this far and you already know what micrometers are, you probably already know what a decimal equivalence chart is, but I'd be, I would be remiss if I didn't go over it and at least show you what it is. So if you're looking at micrometers, you need to know what nominal measurements are. A decimal equivalence chart is by far one of the greatest tools to keep with your measurement tools. It helps you in referencing when using micrometers or calipers or even a ruler or a tape measure. It's honestly really the most useful tool I've found in measuring, designing, and making parts. I keep one at my desk. I keep one in my shop. It's valuable for when you're tapping holes, for when you're looking for the right drill size. It, for the Imperial system, it has all the drill bit sizes for letters, numbers, and fractional. And it also will tell you the tap size drills you need for certain taps. Some of them will have a little side chart for metric taps as well. It gives you a nice well-rounded measurement system for referencing when you're designing parts or measuring parts. It's really very helpful. So when you have a micrometer and you have an odd fraction and you think you might, wait, I know that one. It might be a nominal that I can use. You can at least look and see what they're in between. So even whenever you're using arbitrary numbers that don't mix within the fractions, it actually really helps you figure out what range you're in, get your head in the right space, and it is a good habit to get into to really reference your numbers and know which point in the scale you are using. You can conceptualize the scale, understand what size you're using, and maybe think about the tooling you would use if you're in the design stage of what size drill you would use to get to this size. So when you're machining, you might say, I need a 0.275 hole. So that's 25 thousandths over a nominal quarter inch, right? So maybe you would use a quarter inch to get to that point. But you might think, what's 275 closer to? There might actually be another drill bit that's closer to that. If you go to the chart, you can see that a letter I drill actually gets you to 272. If you do a seven millimeter, it's actually 0.2756. So it really helps you reference and think about that and you might get a lot closer to reality. A lot of engineers with that practical experience will assign arbitrary numbers without thinking about the manufacturing of an object. This will help you think about the reality of it and what drill bit a machinist or you could use to get to that final point so you can get it to spec. So when you're designing something, don't assign an arbitrary number. You might think you want a 275 hole, but a quarter inch will do. At least you can reference it and say, oh, well, I'll just use a regular size drill bit to make it easier. I don't have to buy a special drill bit or get a special size or bore it or ream it to size to get to exactly what I'm doing because I said so. You can actually think about what the person making it will be and make it easier for them. So the manufacturability is a very large part of this thing. And looking at a decimal equivalence chart will help you get there. And I've been using I've been using this in correlation with micrometer and calipers since probably 2007, and I still use it. I have a lot of it kind of memorized, but the smaller increments like 30 seconds or arbitrarily, arbitrary sixteenths in there, I don't have them all memorized. But as I get further in life and frequent this chart more, they become 
internalized and I can just reference those, but it really helps you. And you can never know enough. You can never have this fully memorized unless you have like a completely photographic memory. Some of you might, but having this around is an, an indispensable tool. I cannot emphasize that enough. And you should always think about when you're designing products for making, for manufacturing, you should think about the manufacturability of it and how it can manifest in reality because your design may be awesome, but if it can't be yielded in reality, then it's not that awesome. There's a reason why a lot of machine shops make jokes about engineers because engineers will design something arbitrarily without thinking about the real application of it, the real machining of it, the real physicality of it, and what it takes to get the final part. And so if you educate yourself, learn a decimal equivalence chart, and really think about the reality of it as you're designing, keep this by you while you're doing CAD or something else, it will drastically improve your productivity, it will drastically improve your quality in the end, and it might improve your relationships with the people making your stuff.